This is a short little production about a strange electrical problem I ran into one time on a Ranger, <clears throat> on a Ford Ranger, when I was piddling around at the dealership. And <laughs> this thing right here, it, 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 it illustrates how you just about have to have a wiring schematic, wiring schematic, and you need to know how to read the wiring schematic to track down an annoying problem without doing a bunch of overlays and you know wire splicing and all that kind of thing. Uh, having a wiring schematic is really important and knowing how to read it as well. But there's all different kinds of wiring schematics too and so uh, you kind of need to be able to navigate your way through them. Those track wiring diagrams Volkswagen uses are kind of annoying until you figure them out. But those were the first ones I was exposed to as far as wiring schematics went. <coughs> Anyway, this was a 99 Ford Ranger uh, with 103,000 miles on it and it, whenever you turn the key on, it would, the starter would start spinning and it would fire up the engine. It didn't need to see the start position on the key, it just fired up the engine. Okay, okay so you, ca it, you could switch it on after it started. The starter remained engaged and the drive was overrunning drive on the starter would be working overtime um, unless the key was turned to the off position or the gear selector was moved to any position other than neutral or park. Okay, so that pointed to a short circuit somewhere between the transmission range sensor, which would be your neutral safety switch, and the uh, ignition switch. Removing the starter relay would disengage the starter as well. And so that was something else. See, I started methodically working my way trying to track this thing down and pinpoint where was this problem coming from. Okay, so you might notice I've got the ignition switch. This is a ganged switch, by the way, which means all three of the switches you see in that little dotted box up there are moving together. You might notice they're connected by a dotted line, so when you turn one of them on, you're turning them all on. They all got the same positions, but they have different circuits coming in <clears throat> and different circuits going out and so that's the point of that so that's what a gang switch is all about well with the relay removed and the test light probe and to put in the coil cavities of the relay socket it was evident that a short to power was available at the relay coil when the key was on and this problem was there most of the time and so that gave me the opportunity to find out what was wrong by tracking it down See, if it's coming and going, it's a lot more difficult. But if it's there all the time, you can typically find it. All right. So if I put it in, like for reverse or any other position besides park and neutral, uh, the light would go out. So it was telling me the starter relay was being energized uh, by wherever this voltage was coming from. And the only it was breaking the circuit whenever you put the transmission range sensor in anything except park or neutral. Now, the, with the ignition switch in the start position, the start terminal on the switch carries power from the battery through fuse 24, through the neutral safety switch, all the way to the starter relay, which energizes and spins the starter. And there you see how that circuit works. Not complicated at all. Very simple. Well, I experimented with the test light that was illuminated at that call thing. And I found out, by the way, that if I removed fuse 20, then the light would go out. So I'm saying, ah, okay, so the origin of this power is coming from the run part. Uh, let me get this right here. The run part of this element of this gang switch. It's not supposed to, but it does. You notice on this, nothing is connected to the start part of this switch because there doesn't need to be. So when you go all the way to the start, Nothing's being sent anywhere, but so this right here, it was coming from here. So that was now when I removed that, that interrupted that. So I said, okay, that's got me a, you know, pointing me a little closer to the direction that I need to go. In other words, I'm I'm vectoring in on it like a missile on a target. See, that's what I'm trying to do. All right, fuse 20 carries power from the switch run terminal down to the radio and central timer module which is also the gym module but the central timer module was a cheaper version of that that wasn't quite as um, 
complicated on the inside. But um, that Fuse 20 was what carried that power to both the radio and the central timer module, as you can see right there. All right, <clears throat> but it has nothing to do with the starter under normal circumstances. It's not supposed to have anyway. Okay, so pulling fuse 20 killed the short. Was it possible that circuits 1000 and 102 were shorted together? Now, that was my question next. Uh, maybe that circuit 1000 was backfeeding the ignition switch run power through, through fuse 28 to the starter relay coil. Okay, so... Alright, so the two circuits in question are right here. Circuit 1000 and circuit 1002 enter the central timer module right here. That's the two wires right there that I've got circled and indicated. Alright, so there's a, there is a common point that looks like it may be something. We, those wires weren't shorted together. I mean, we figured out that they weren't shorted together. And so it had to be inside the central timer module. Now, sometimes replacing the module is a sort of a expensive proposition. And if there's any way around it, it's the best way to take that way. One example of this was when that girl came to my office one morning at the college and she said that on her Mustang, the one of the one segment of the brake lights on the right side was on all the time. You know, it's got the three little segments of each light on a Mustang. This was an 06 model, I think, something like that. And so I went out there and I got to investigating that and I found out that the uh, generic electronic module had a separate wire feeding each segment. That was so the Mustang could have those sequential lights if they so decided to program it that way. But there was a driver inside of her module that was keeping that one light on all the time that had failed. And so what I did to prevent her battery from going dead was I just took that bulb out. <clears throat> now I, I could have basically scotch locked that wire to the to another light, you know, and made it, you know, cut the wire going back to the module and made it so that the light would work the way it was supposed to. Because she didn't have sequential lights. When she turned on her turn signals, they were just, you know, on let me blink, 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 all three of them at the same time. And so I said, well, that's going to keep your battery from going dead. She said, well, what is causing this? And I, that module up in the front, that is a, a generic electronic smart junction box, whatever you call it on that one. And uh, I trouble, I mean, I checked that out and it was going to be $400 for that box and programming and all that. And she said, well, I guess I'll have to start saving up money for that. And I said, well, there's no point in saving up money for that if you can stand to be without that one light. Uh, you need to decide if having that one light working is worth $400 to you. If it was me, I would either, you know, wire it to the other lights or I would just let that stay like it is. Well, why did it need this connection right here? That was my next question. Why in the world did I have to have that connection? So, I found an error in the radio section. According to the one particular test step, the circuit in question, circuit 1000, fed through fuse 28 has to be juiced up for the radio to work. But that wasn't the case on this truck. The radio worked just fine without it. And so I removed fuse 28 and the radio still worked. Research revealed that the only reason the ZTM module needed that circuit was related to the illuminated entry as it interfaces with the remote keyless entry. The shop manual reads this way. The generic electronic module illuminates the interior lamps when an unlock signal is received from the remote any theft personality module. In other words, when you hit your fob, it turns the inside lights on, right? 25 seconds have elapsed since the illuminated entry feature was activated and the courtesy lamp feature is not activated. So if you don't have your courtesy lamp switch on, it's going to go off 25 seconds later. If the gem receives a request from the wrap module, in other words, generic electronic or CTM in this case, uh, the courtesy lamp feature is not activated. So that's when now why it needs to see start, see? So whenever you another point whenever you turn it on start, it turns off the interior lights uh, after you've turned them on with the fob and all that. But if the ignition is in the run or start position and the courtesy lamp switch is not activated, that's important. See what I'm saying? Okay, so that's why that's why that thing needed to see that. 
Okay, this one was not equipped with a remote anti-theft personality module on a GM, by the way. The route module stands for, stands for retained accessory power, which is how it keeps the radio and the windows working when you switched off the key for a little while. Okay, so this box was $200. The radio could have been disconnected to see if the problem returned, but as it was, since Fuse 28 wasn't needed on this vehicle, we removed it. The problem never happened again. It's possible the circuit fed by Fuse 28 might have been feeding back through the bad diode in the ZTM, but it didn't matter. I was uh, working one time on a... I can't remember what kind of car it was. It was, a, it, might, it was either a Mustang or a Ranger. And the wipers didn't work right. It seemed like it was a Ranger. The wipers would do crazy things, and I can't remember exactly what they were doing, but they just flat didn't work right. But by the time I got through tracking that one, it was the radio that was causing the wipers not to work, and I couldn't find any viable connection between those. But in the boneyard down there was a totaled out vehicle that had a radio just like it, and I went down there and took that radio out of that car in the boneyard and brought it up there and plugged it into that Ranger, and that wiper problem was gone. And so these electronic things can be really wacky. I have, I've got a whole, I got a bunch of other stories I could tell about that. Uh, but the point is, if you Read the description and operation part if you've got it available to you. This was from the older all data software. Um, get good at reading the vehicle schematics and reading the description and operation is crucial to understanding the repair path, but not every shop manual includes that section. Knowledge is power and whenever you absorb the knowledge you need to figure a problem out, you'll fix it just about every time. Well. That's the end of this very short presentation, and I just figured I'd go ahead and let you guys in on that fun little project, and I'll talk to you next time.